Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say that, like, if you see me shiftily sort of like looking over here, I actually have my own computer set up so I can see the audience online so that if you happen to want to turn your cameras on, I will, in fact, be able to see your face, which is very nice. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, and I also wanted to preface this, like, I really, um, really need to get some input on this, on what I'm going to present right now, because I haven't really had a chance to, like, have it settle into, like, a form that I think makes sense. There's, like, so I think some, like, issues of, like, finessing the argument that I, that I think I'm really um, facing right now, that, I, that I'm really only at the beginning of. So, so I feel like I have a lot of, like, raw material here, and then the kind of the overarching story I'm not sold on. So please, um, as you, as I get comments, that's really what I want to, like, I, I'm really, really appreciating, you know, like input on, on that, on that level. Okay. From the vantage point of both Russian and Western liberals today, the question about post-Soviet Russia um, is a bit similar to what 1950s Western Marxists used to ask about Soviet Russia. I, when did it all go wrong? How did our project, which seemed so promising at the time, end up in the rut of post-Soviet authoritarianism? What happened to all of those palpable feelings of freedom that so many of our informants, especially the Russian intelligentsia and their urbanized, educated mass audience um, had felt in moments like 19, August 1991, when they supposedly stood up shoulder to shoulder against the fascist junta and triumphed. So the Russian history at the threshold of prehistoric and the post-Soviet era, roughly speaking the years between 1987 and 1995 um, is rich with these cases of apparent misrecognition. But particularly interesting to me are the late perestroika years, it's 1989-1991, when Gorbachev moved the country towards a free market and a representative parliamentarianism, obviously with caveats, and when rivals to Gorbachev rose up through these new market and parliamentary spaces and claimed power in them in ways that were entirely unanticipated by Gorbachev and many others, chief among um, these, um, these actors was Yeltsin, who made his career in the bizarre promise that the Russian Soviet Federated Republic could secede from the USSR. Um, all this unanticipated ad hoc maneuvering reached a crisis point in August 1991 when a group of high Politburo readers, leaders attempted to seize power, remove Gorbachev from office, and to establish a militarized state of emergency committee, GKCP. And then once the coup failed, despite Gorbachev's own apparent feeling of triumphant return to a democratic Moscow, the Soviet president was already effectively sidelined from real leadership thanks to Yeltsin's maneuvering. So at the time that murky grand history was unfolding on the streets of Moscow, a smaller but also murky history was unfolding in Moscow's mass media circles when the old Soviet behemoth of Gostilia Radio, and this is it, uh, Astankina, was um, rapidly undergoing an evolution towards a post-Soviet market model. At this time, members of Pedestroika's most culturally impactful show, Vzgliad, formed the private media company Vid, um, which in 1990, 1991, produced both Vzgliad and a few other shows, most notably Capital Show Poly Chudes, um, the Capital Show Field of Miracles. Um, oh, oh, sorry, okay. Um, so Vzgliad permanently ended its existence in, in August, 1991 just after airing over three hours of material dedicated to the triumph of what felt like a mass movement against the Gokashi Pepuch and its immediate aftermath. Meanwhile, Polish Yes has continued to exist uh, through uh, 2021. Um, and actually, I think it, it, it's the contract with Vita is not going to be renewed for 2022, um, and the show is changing its name as of next year. Um, but, you know, we've made it this far. Um, so the lack of foresight in those final moments of Zgliad aligns well with the lack of foresight of Gorbachev just after the failed coup. In the immediate aftermath of Gokachepe, the show predicts the rise of Gorbachev's reforged presidency, not its agony. Yeltsin is almost entirely missing from the reporting. Some of the show's featured defenders of the parliament are future anti-Yeltsin bogeymen of 1993, like Kozbulatov. Um, similarly, the show also uh, predicts its own return on air on the liberated uh, central television after a year of hardship, as opposed to the show's Im imminent demise. Um, why did the host misread so thoroughly both their own and the country's very much immediate future? Uh, was it just their personal perspective 
or perhaps we can take them to be speaking on behalf of a certain collective uh, discursive subject of the anti gakachipa constituency. So I want to try to approach these questions today by thinking about the final year of Zgliad alongside the first year of Vid and also of Polichudias, a game show that I think half consciously expresses the civic worldview of Vid and its mass audience in this moment of political transition. Um, in it, I want to focus not on messages of commitment to straightforward political positions like pro-democracy or even necessarily pro-capitalism, although of course these specific messages surface often, both on Zgliad and Polichudias. What I want to highlight instead is early Vid's intense investment in the idea that a newly liberated collective was coming into being as a result of the hustle of free flowing social relations, a free style of conduct writ large, involving newfangled money schemes, but not limited to them, a free style not exactly associated with being pro Gorbachev, maybe even less so of being pro Yeltsin, but nevertheless a freestyle that I think was more the result of a certain mass interpretation of the Gorbachev of Gorbachev's perestroika's uh, ideas about freedom in a certain sense more late Soviet than a post-Soviet concept of freedom. So so in Russian cultural memory, Vzgliad, meaning view, is often remembered as Perestroika's most impactful television product. Evgeny Dodelev, a sensationalist journalist and former participant of Vzgliad, subtitles his memoristic book about the show The Beatles of Perestroika a kind of sign of the times without which the perestroika is unthinkable. This isn't just his nostalgic affectation. There appear to be a whole lot of Russians, including the author of the introduction to Dodelev's book, who accused the show of actually bringing down the USSR. So without wishing to contribute to this outsized argument about historical agency, I do think that by tracking the show's demise in 91 and the rise of Vid's conglomerate out of its ashes, it might be possible for us to understand a little more about the commitments to freedom that motivated the historical actors of this period and to understand what they misunderstood about those commitments. So currently the scholarly perspective on Zgliad, which ran between 1987 and 1991, can be summed up with the words of its hosts. Uh, for example, uh, Dmitry Zakharov. He's the guy in the white, in the white jacket. Um, on, on the, yeah, over there, on the, I guess, in the picture is left on, our, on, on your right. Um, so he says, Zgliad was a toy after all. It was provocative and revolutionary for its time, but still a toy. Zakharov means here that Zgliad was unserious. It was not a real weapon of journalistic combat with the regime, but more of a play pistol handed down from the authorities with their approval for the young boys to amuse themselves within carefully set limits. The statement by Zakharov dovetails with Christine Evans' study of late Soviet central television in general, and of Perestroika Arabs Glad in particular, which she tackles in the epilogue to her book, um, um, Moscow Primetime. No, I'm sorry, no, that's, that's Kristen Rathi's book. No, her book is From Truth to Time. Um, so for Evans, Vlad is a natural child of Soviet uh, CT, uh, central television, and certainly not some sort of foreign body or enfant terrible within it. As she points out, the youth desk, Moladyoshka, where Zgrad was produced, was full of well-trained higher-ups who learned how to do television back in the thaw and who knew how to create some highly engaging, creative, albeit, albeit explicitly apolitical TV shows throughout the censorious and reactionary Brezhnev era. Quote, what was needed, and this is uh, Evans's quote, what was needed were elaborate theatrical premises and cinematical, cin cinematographic conceits designed to convince viewers that what they were viewing was genuinely spontaneous and unmediated. Thus, Zgliad selected spaces that not only fostered informal forms of speech, but also sought to convince viewers that central television's established systems of control and censorship had, in their cases, been circumvented. As one episode of Zgliad in 1987 put it, the show aimed to bring viewers Quote, that which is normally behind doors, Mark, do not enter, staff only. Vzglad imagined a fantastical new setting for newsmaking in which teletype machines spilled their contents onto the sofa tables of young guys who were able to read the news to you straight from the foreign source. The self-presentation, clothing, and speech of Vzglad's young hosts was, were also essential to the show's atmosphere of live immediacy. The hosts of Vzglad read straight from the teletype machine printouts as if they had no television training at all stumbling over their words, saying um, and otherwise violating all the grammatical and stylistic conventions of CT's news broadcasts. What is more, the hosts of Zgliad also openly disagreed with one another on air, sparring, debating, and opening up questions to viewers. The new host's clothing was, uh, was likewise informal. Like the choice of, of the settings, the program's host's abrupt speech and casual dress were a radical departure uh, for CT's uh, news programming. They were not, however, new to central television's entertainment programming and specifically to game shows. 
So I think a good distillation of everything Evan says here in the following, uh, we can see in the following parody of Zgliad, um, performed at its one year anniversary party in 1988 by three comics who act as the show's three hosts. Okay, we get the idea. Um, so, um, so there's this moment, right, um, when they're speaking. So they're, they're like this, they're this kind of, um, oh yeah, I wanted to show you a little bit more. Sorry, there's, yeah. I'm going to skip through a little bit. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to cut it off there. So um, I just wanted to get that, that lineup of... Uh, of uh, of uh, visitors on the show. Okay, so um, so so you can see this like silly um, overemphasis of informality, right, and unfettered speech, right, and then also this parody of the show's democratism, as Soviet parlance would have had it, would have called it. It's possible guests include writers, poets, drug addicts, psychopaths. And as Evans explains, uh, theorizations of television since the Thaw era prized the idea of, quote, appearing responsive to audience demands and, con and concerns while maintaining political control by a single party. Evans concludes that the performance uh, of responsiveness to the public, the acknowledgement of conflicting views, in short, attention to the outward forms of democracy, though not its substance, was a key element of late Soviet TV entertainment and also seems to be essential to the democratic authoritarian state Putin has built. That's all Evans' quote. Paraphrase a little bit. Okay. Um, so, Maria Mayokis and Ilya Kukulin in their 2007 article about early 1990s mass media draw a conclusion similar to Evans regarding Zgliad's mere playing at freedom with the same implications for our contemporary post Soviet authoritarian moment. Having interviewed a number of participants in Zgliad versus other perestroika and post Soviet media outfits, they conclude that despite all of the perestroika freedoms that appeared on Zgliad in the 1980s, Despite all of the show's muckracking investigative reporting, all of its debates, interviews, fast fire encounters with Pristorica's principal actors, from the aging Marxist Nina Andreeva to the future leaders of Gokachipa, such as Yanaev and Akhremeyev, both of whom appear on the show multiple times. Uh, despite all of this pluralism taking place on the show, as the host Lubimov would have called it, um, commitment to civic freedom was not a matter of principle for Zgliad, but the outcome of ad hoc situational uses of opportunities, just like the transition to the open market that hit Zgliad in 1990 when the showrunners created Veed. Mayofis and Kukul didn't get the sense that the folks of Zgliad and Veed were media actors that, quote, were organized around the basis of available resources in advantageous situations, as opposed to an idea or a project for the future. On the flip side, from my office in Kukulian writing 2007, it seemed like Interfax and Echa Moskwe were examples of better future-oriented idea-driven projects, which is why they were less susceptible to post-Soviet state capture. 
So as tempting as it is to condemn the Vid team for its lack of reflection in its own civic virtues, and more broadly, the virtues of the anti gakachepe mass coalition, that was perhaps too hastily referred to by too many influential voices as the pro-democracy side, um, I want to bracket this final outcome out for a moment um, and instead attempt um, a more generous reading of the collective commitments of Zgliad and Navid uh, team, both in the late 1980s and especially in 91, the year leading up to the anti gakachepe triumph. So first, in the late 1980s, it is well true that the show's Maladyoshka, this, uh, the youth desk pedigree, makes it very much the product of dominant late Soviet party overseen mainstream culture. Um, building on that Maladyoshka pedigree, Zgrad's free style places a certain emphasis on what free association feels like that I think has consequences for thinking about questions of good faith and freedom in the 1991 anti gakachepe movement. So very recently, really, like as of three days ago, I started thinking about the sociality on Zgrad in terms of the sociality of blood networks, as described by Alina Lidzinova. I'm especially interested in the way that Blatt sociology combines the sensibility of friendly altruism and misrecognized self-dealing. What if we assume that Blatt's sensibility about what Zgliad was doing under the conditions of, of glossness? In, the case, in that case, that gesture of Zgliad taking us past the keep out staff only sign that Evans mentions doesn't necessarily read as a cynical manipulation of a politically transgressive idiom. Instead, I think it reads as an invitation to the audience to enter into a kind of playful, open-ended relationship with the show where it uses the state resource of central television in a preferential fashion to give us some aspects of Western and Soviet culture and counterculture that is otherwise hard to reach. As Vinyama highlights, this kind of sensibility was important for stabilizing the Soviet shortage economy, but it always runs a bit orthogonal to the intentions of the regime and really originates out of broadly shared collective practices of everyday life. So eventually, glosses about Soviet politics, then debates about free market initiatives make it onto the show as the as the striker wears on. But in all of these cases, what is presented on Zgrad is always supposed to circulate through an open-ended network of effective, friendly relationships bound by an ethic of friendly altruism and a bit of self-dealing, though just self-dealing in social capital, unlike in the case of actual blood, which typically involved more tangible things. Um, so which brings us to the activities of V in 1990-91. In the lead up to October 1990, Zgrad is on the cutting edge of the politically permissible. With the hosts Politkovsky, Mukusev, and Zakharov doing more and more muckracking reporting, and the hosts of Lubim, the host Lubimov and Listev overseeing more and more edgy, politically pluralist forums on the shows. Again, pluralism is his favorite term of Lubimov to describe what he's doing. At the same time, in October 1990, Lubimov and Listev take advantage of the changing economic legislation in the USSR and create the Vid. TV uh, media holding, and the process cutting out some other members of the Zgliad team, most notably Mukusev. Uh, like all business at the of the time, the transition to Vid was a freewheeling affair with rather murky legal grounds, created as, a, uh, as an independent or at least parallel institution to central television, um, as my office couldn't describe it. Vid would make content, uh, sort out advertisements, package its production, and then sell the whole package back to CT. Lots of lawyers were employed to make this transition look legitimate, while the backroom deal involved a flow of cash money from which the former host Mukusev was cut out because he refused to play by the new informal rules, allegedly on moral principles, and also because he publicly aired vague hints about some organizational aspects of the caper in an interview for the journal Aganyok in December 1990. In the aftermath of the Aganyok publication, Mukusev recalls meeting Vistiv for the last time and telling him that both of them would be better off leaving Moscow and doing less lucrative but good journalism out in Siberia. He interrupted me, um, pulled out from his pocket a wrapped stack of $100 bills, something that I saw for the first time in my life, and said, you want me to trade this for some kind of Novosibirsk? He looked at me over his glasses in such a way that even though he were, we were the same height, it seemed to me as if he were looking down at some kind of not especially smart, totally unfortunate, profoundly unwell human being who doesn't understand even the most basic things. But this time I already knew that the incorporating documentation of for Vid, for which, uh, which I too had taken part in creating, was rewritten illegally, removing me not only from ownership and control, but even dropping me from the list of shareholders. My closest colleagues had done this. I said, you know, Vlad, if this is how you do business, sooner or later, you guys are gonna shoot each other. He grumbled, shrugged and left. Mukusev's account of the encounter with Listiev is emblematic of how business in post-Soviet Russia was done. As Kotkin has pointed out, it isn't entirely right to call it legal or illegal because there, were virtually, there was virtually no judicial infrastructure that could distinguish the one from the other. 
And a few years later, in 1995, they really did shoot each other. Listev was murdered. And both Dodonev and Mukusev strongly implied that Lyubimov was the one who ordered the hit. So of course, it is tempting to see the financial backroom dealing at Vida standing in stark contrast to and laying bare the hypocrisy of the supposedly politically idealistic content unfolding on Vzglad at the time. But then again, let's hold back and consider what Vida actually did as a TV conglomerate in charge of Vzglad, especially in 1990-91. So in December 1990, Vzglad was taken off the air by Central Television's party higher-ups at about the same time as Gorbachev's foreign minister Eduard Shevardnadze publicly resigned from his position and warned the, warned the country of a coming military dictatorship. However, because of his glad was already being produced by Vid, as opposed to directly by CT, the show could do something that was previously unthinkable in the Soviet media system. His glad was able to go underground. So throughout 1991, the team continued producing shows in unofficial studio spaces and selling them via home videotapes. And I think occasionally airing them on hyper-local uh, news, uh, uh, lo local networks. Meanwhile, other apolitical viewed productions, such as Listiv's game show, Polish Yes, there were also a couple of others at this time, um, including actually uh, Konstantin and Matador had already started. Um, so um, they continued to broadcast throughout the turbulent months in the lead up to the August 1991 putsch. And presumably the revenue and the means of production from those uh, permitted shows were uh, supporting the production of Zgliad. So in short, the relationship between Vida and Zgliad need not be understood necessarily as one of CD underbelly versus respectable civic veneer. Rather, they're enmeshed in one another indistinctly in a way that resembles the enmeshing of altruism and self-dealing in blood. And that very enmeshing is what feels like freedom. All of this then comes to a head in August 1991 when the Kors Glad team, minus Mokusev, ends up getting holed up in the, in the White House with the anti gokachipa coalition and then manages to broadcast three hours of fascinating footage, live or almost live, on what then became Yeltsin-controlled uh, central television as the coup days drew to a close. This final Zglad broadcast is an interesting primary source because of how it stages the sociology of the anti gokachipa coalition holed up in Moscow's White House, which in a sense is contiguous with the sociality of Zglad of the 80s and contiguous with this problem of the impossibility of distinguishing civic virtue from self-dealing when it comes to the feeling of freedom for these actors. Thus, we get some jarring TV images, such as the world-renowned cellist Mstislav Rastropovich giving an interview while cheerfully holding a machine gun. Other, more interesting paradoxes of the coalition are told in words. Listev and Lubimov talk about the blood brotherhood that has formed among the most incredible panoply of defenders of the White House. Um, so Lubimov says, racketeers with wads of cash came and took our agitation sheets and went to distribute it among all the army units. The Boers gave us food. Poets gave, gave us verses. Afghan vets gave us weapons. The banks hauled over a bunch of Xerox machines and printing equipment. The factory next door came over and brought us gas masks for a possible attack. So in a way, the strange glossing over the conflicts of interest within the White House camp culminates in Zgrad's, in Zgrad's reporting on the two most prominent national leaders of the post-coup moment, Gorbachev and Yeltsin. Yeltsin actually um, is actually some of the hosts of Zgrad seem to not like. They seem to be wary about him. I think because of that, from their perspective in this moment, he stands for the potential closure of this open-ended anti gokachipa sociology. Thus, the show discusses the need to not vilify rank-and-file communists and inveighs against the Yeltsin team's frenzy of ad hoc adverse possession of CPSU property on Russia's territory. After all of that, Lubimov signs off his commentary with an admonition. Whoever battles to take the spot of the enemy always reaps defeat. The very end of the broadcast prints the statement on screen as the show's last word against the backdrop of background of the Dzerzhinsky monument uh, getting taken down by the crowd. So instead of celebrating Yeltsin though, Zgrad gives its moral predilection to Gorbachev. Lubimov wonders, will we have a president or not? The junta didn't hide all of its intentions. But today's session of the Supreme Soviet has taken place. Gorbachev's speech there, I'll be honest, I've always sympathized very much with Gorbachev, sometimes more, sometimes less carefully. But overall, deep in my soul, I believe that it would be like this. Now it seems to me that perhaps finally, Gorbachev will become our president. Maybe he has already become one. In the next day's broadcast, the very last one under the Zgliad brand, the Lubimov-led team airs a many hours long encounter with Gorbachev and his entourage in which we learn of the circumstances of Gorbachev's forced imprisonment and escape from a summer Crimean residence. The show opens up 
with a remarkably failed prediction from Gorbachev himself. The Soviet president is, quote, so happy that all of our democracy, that what has happened in these conditions of our society did not allow this reactionary turn to take place. He concludes, quote, um, that now folks will finally understand us and support us. And the Democrats must show how they differ from these other people who wanted to use tanks uh, and weapons. The segment then commits over in an hour to conversations with Gorbachev's closest cadres without suspecting that all of them are already empty suits, who within days will discover they're unable to make anyone carry out their orders as opposed to the orders of Yeltsin's loyalists. So neither Lubimov nor Gorbachev appear to consider the possibility that instead of the August coup cementing Gorbachev's survival as the leading guarantor of the future of democracy in the USSR, this event in fact marks his agony. A similar misunderstanding of the historical situation pertains to Vzgliad itself. At the conclusion of the first two episodes, Politkovsky theatrically removes the Vzgliad logo from the wall, where he had temporarily installed it two hours prior, and states that even though it is not yet clear how much has changed at central television as a result of the coup, for the moment, quote, I say until soon, uh, as opposed to goodbye. So it is true that as far as the three hosts themselves are concerned, they're not saying goodbye. Listev Lubimov and Politkovsky will each shortly start appearing regularly on screen through vid programming, now as showrunners of their own shows, with formats taken directly from Zgrad. Between 91 and 93, Politkovsky led the show Politburo. Lubimov, who is the villain of both Mokusev's and Dolorev's accounts, ran the political forum Krasny Kvadrat, which was apparently shut down on Yeltsin's orders in the aftermath of um, October 1993 mini-civil war. Um, and Listev produced a whole bunch of uh, vid shows, but personally ran less explicitly political, but still very much civically engaged programs such as Tiama and Chaspik. All of these shows were directly inherited from Zgliad. They're all very clearly standalone elaborations on segments that the showrunners respectively ran on the Zgliad platform themselves. Still, this moment that feels like a triumph of Zgliad itself turns out to have marked the end of the line for that particular show. Why this lack of foresight, both with respect to Gorbachev and also with respect to their own immediate future? So again, I think it's because of the way that the enmeshing of civic virtue and market field self-dealing works for them. And to clarify the sensibility, let us now consider Polichudias, the other major production of V in 1990-91, which did not get canceled either before the coup or afterwards, and which today is the only show in the Vid portfolio that traces its origins to the Gorbachev era, and which at times in its long-running history probably came closest in ratings and overall name recognition to the old Mzgliad. So allegedly conceived by the CT old hand Lysenka in a hotel room in Paris in early 1990 as a mix of the French Wheel of Fortune and the American Deal or No Deal, uh, the capital show Field of Miracles, Poilet Chudias, is actually something entirely different from its supposed American forebears. Partly because of the Soviet game show heritage at central television, but mostly because of the heavily historically inflected social meaning that the show took on almost from the moment of its inception. So originally, Polishidias was led by Listia, and it was premised on a fairly formulaic, quick paced format, seemingly entirely about the promotion of uh, capitalist new values. Um, three sets of three guests would be invited to spin the wheel and guess letters in a word based on a clue. The winner, if there was one, would be promoted, would, would be promised a mystery prize. However, when it came time for them to claim it, Listiv would approach them and offer increasing sums of money in exchange for it. The player would then have to decide whether to take the money or the mystery prize, and Listiv would have to decide whether to offer more money or to stop. So other prizes would also be ran offered at random uh, during various points of the game. And in these very early shows, the argument over the money, as well as the stacks of cash appearing on set, was supposed to be the focus point. As Nibimo has noted in retrospect, this focus on financial greed, alchness, was fairly risky at the time because it seemed to break the old Soviet taboo against celebrating financial self-interest as a value. And Nibimo says this in, in, in like a retrospective documentary on Polish Yes. So it's true that Polish Yes was the first show on TV to feature money. And the show What, Where, When, would follow suit a year later. But was the sociality displayed in the show really structured around the enjoyment of breaking a moral taboo or of post-Soviet new values? On an individual level, Easter perhaps really did think he was going in that direction at first. Off screen, he was flashing stacks of $100 bills to Mukusev. And on screen in commercial breaks in the early 90s, he regularly appeared in a tuxedo, like here, petting a show dog and adv advertising European cruises on the cruise ship probably intentionally, ironically named Fyodor Dostoevsky. 
However, on screen at Polish Ideas, where um, first Listiv and then Leonid Yakubovich featured alongside show participants in the audience, a different kind of exchange was taking hold that increasingly became less about explicit monetary enjoyment or new values and far more about perestroika freestyle of informal social relations, even though this is already not necessarily perestroika. So the somewhat spontaneous transformation of Polish ideas began already at some point in 1991, when one player arrived on the set with a prize of her own, meant for Listiv, a plush doll that she made herself that she wanted to give to the host. Once Listiv stepped down as showrunner in the late 1991 and handled, handed the reins to Leonid Yukovovich, a man who had the gift of being incomparably more folksy than Listiv ever could be, and that's him, um, the exchange of stuff escalated rapidly. What started out as innocent homemade knickknacks or pickled goods over the years would escalate into time intensive, complicated productions, including amateur performances, ridiculous and time consuming wardrobe changes for Yukovovich complicated rituals of consumption of beverages and foodstuffs, the bringing on set of live animals such as horses and etc. The gifts and performances from the audience promoted, uh, prompted further questions. The spontaneity of their responses prompted follow-ups. The point is just time slot grew to accommodate this extra content, going from the original 30 to 40 minutes to roughly 50 or 60, not counting commercial breaks. Ultimately, this meant that the actual game aspect of the show was sidelined. And the show became about something else. It was about the enjoyment of communing around an event of informal, spontaneous forms of multi-directional exchange. Um, let me show you. Uh, there's a in this documentary. There's a there's a there's a good line of, of, of some of these gifts. <laughs> Look at that brat, right? Language. Here, let me let me get to that to that good lineup here. One second. Here we go. This is this is a good lineup here. Some pickles, some food. Okay. So anyway, there's there's a little bit there. Um, I think it, it, you, it you can you can watch it on your own time. But there's 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 a lot of a lot of these. Um, let me uh, here get back to this. Um, and that documentary was actually specifically dedicated to the opening up of the museum of the gifts that were given to on Polish yes. So, um, so as Evans has noted, Maladjoshka alums were always ready to make use of spontaneous energy coming from their audiences. This seemed to be what happened on Polish yes. The show thought it was going to be Western and capitalist, but very quickly realized there was an arena for a kind of extension of Blatt's Blatt sociology to the 1990s conditions in which money on the show became a part of things, but did not necessarily read as a clear cut symbol of either a cynical libertarian ethic or a liberal capitalist one. And this is very much unlike how money read on other most socially restrictive shows like uh, Varashilov's intellectual casino, What Were When. And this in turn folds back onto the question of the kind of coalition that Zgliad and Vid perceived as taking shape at the White House in 1991 and why they downplayed Yeltsin and celebrated Gorbachev. When Listiv and Libimov said that they were excited about the fact that anti dikachev forces were uh, being a panoply of, as he said, protest protesters, journalists, dissidents, virtuoso musicians, bankers, and racketeers, they were expressing in that way a belief in the idea of freedom as first and foremost an ad hoc spontaneous exchange, the freedom of the hustle, among ties that can all be imagined as horizontal, among disparate people, yes, but ones that do not clearly have to be broken up or theorized into more distinct political units with clear-cut antagonisms, including around questions of money. 
They were excited about the coming of a freewheeling era in which self-dealing and altruism supposedly existed side by side in a kind of collective anti-dictatorial jouissance where the thing that was feared about dictatorship was precisely the closure of the, free, the, the freewheeling era. And Gorbachev appeared to them as a president with a future because he seemed like an abstract guarantor who through his sheer existence and far less so his actions was holding open this multifarious civic space unlike the KKCP that wished to shut it down. That's what they thought Gorbachev was saying when he told them that all of our democracy did not allow this reactionary turn to take place. That word democracy didn't necessarily mean a whole lot beyond that mode of spontaneous solidarity associated with this perestroika freestyle. And immediately after August 1991, Zgrad does not regroup because simply said, breaking up Zgrad seemed more fun and more pluralistic even. Now individual showrunners could claim the old formats for themselves. They could sort out ad revenue themselves through shady informal means. But all of this did not have to be perceived by them as in conflict with their civic mission. For the same reason that money and Polish suggests didn't have to be perceived as in conflict with its folksy mode of sociality. This, this inability to make distinctions in turn gets reflected in Polish Udias's name. So when naming the show Polish Udias, Listiv does not calc Wheel of Fortune into Russian. Instead, he chooses the topos out of Alexei Tolstoy's 1930s retelling of the Italian story of Pinocchio. Tolstoy's protagonist, um, Buratina, um, is convinced, uh, is, is convinced uh, to look for the field of miracles by the conniving cat and fox, who tell him that on this magical site, it is possible to bury money, perform a special arcane ritual over it, and then have that money return with enormous interest the next day in the form of a money tree. Um, needless to say, this is a scam, and as such, it is a part of the consciousness-raising life path of Tolstoy's Buratina, who is supposed to get over his elemental desires for get-rich-quick schemes, even as we might well emphasize, emphasize with his reasons for desiring wealth. In this case, we're told that he wants to help his maker, Papa Carlo, climb out of po poverty. The cat and the fox, of course, lie about the field of miracles to defraud Buratina, but they don't lie about the land of fools in which the field supposedly lies, and which becomes a site of action for the second half of Tolstoy's story. The Land of Fools it looks quite a bit like the decrepit old capitalist world of malaise and inequality, which threatens to destroy Buratina and its other wooden doll friends, such as Pierrot and Malvina. And luckily, thanks to Buratina's rough-hewn proletarian courage, um, he's like a little bit like Chipayev in that story, especially at the end. Um, and, uh, and the educational guidance of Malvina, who is kind of his commissar, the dolls get away from the old world's various scammers and state villains and get to live out the rest of their doll lives amidst the joy of, so of socialist de-alienated labor and cultural enlightenment. For Listiev, Tolstoy's socialist outcome for Buratina, or uh, just as Tolstoy's shaping of authorities for Buratina, are clearly irrelevant. Meanwhile, the land of fools most likely sounds more like the wreckage of Russia in 1991. In the middle of this wreckage appears Buratino, who can only hope that the field of miracles is real, and who in that way represents Listiev and his audience. Of course, in retrospect from today, it is easy enough to interpret Listiev's reference to this locale as a tongue-in-cheek admission of the fraudulent nature of the freewheeling 90s, an admission of himself being the cat and the fox relative to his hapless Buratino-like audience. But based on Zdrat's past history, including his experience in 91, I think the moment of the creation of Polish Yes was really a moment where Listiv was in fact more likely to identify both himself and his audience with Buratina, the naive but hopeful doll boy, a boy who's impatient and unlearned, but in an appealing way, a boy left alone by the authorities, left free to understand how socialization and money-making in the land of fools works, a boy who's willing to overlook the obviously thievish nature of some of his companions in this quest, and maybe even his own thievish tendencies, because he hasn't got any other choice. In any case, there isn't and shouldn't be anyone else to turn to who might be more trustworthy and who can explain it to him or straighten them out. That sense of being left free to try one's luck alongside others who seem to be in the same circumstances and in whom it is hard to recognize friends and enemies. That is, I think, the effective meaning of the post-Soviet hustle that won the day in 91. And it's one that post-Soviet authoritarianism has managed to play along with for quite a long time, even as it was consistently shutting down more restrictive political narratives that could have imposed limits on it. Or to put it another way, the post-Soviet Buratina must feel free, unbound from whatever projects other might, others might have for reforming his behavior. As long as that sense of freedom persists, then those others can carry on an unobtrusive political swindle. So, to return to my office in Kukul and Christine Evans' retrospective critiques of Zgrad and Naviv, yes, it is certainly the case that not having a future-oriented project beyond simply the project of furthering the freestyle 
was why V did not evade post-Soviet state capture. But it is also the case that in this lack of a project, Vid was expressing the logic of the anti gukachipa sociality that won the day in 91. Even more so, perhaps we can put it more strongly and say that this lack of a project is at least partly why the anti gukachipa movement won the day in 91. This victory was the peak of the perestroika freestyle, which then became the bedrock of the post-Soviet, which, which is also perhaps why Polishidias is still around, because it still expresses something of that freestyle that shaped the post-Soviet body politic at the point of its early 1990s advent. A freestyle that doesn't necessarily notice authoritarianism, or maybe only recognizes it when it starts looking like something directly opposing the imaginary of unfettered ad hoc exchange, which is how Gakachepe appeared to its opponents in 91, which is perhaps how late Putinism is starting to appear only now since very recently. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I can be heard like this? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. It was really fascinating. Um, what comes to mind as I listen to this, and I'm wondering what you might say in response, is you know with the question of how how the other deed went wrong, um, what was it they did that made it made them more likely to have state capture? Um, I can't help but wonder about the motivation behind the question, not your motivation, mm. but the question on this um, on this thing for a long time. But I'm wondering, is there a kind of hygienic impulse to cut them off um, and, and explain them away um, so that we um, so that we can identify them with something bad that the religious reject as if they're somehow different from other groups. That is retrospectively somehow the idea that they had infighting or that they actually wanted to have money or something like that taints them, even though presumably everybody was fighting on themselves and everybody at some point you know, was trying to monetize things. I'm just I'm suspicious of, of what seems to be a kind of purity discourse that, that um, underlies all this. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could address that. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's actually why I ended up. I'm so so. I'm sort of like clear, like trying to clear my own sort of like head here and figure out the kind of the right theoretical framework for thinking about this. I think this is why I was so attracted to Lizinova's blot, right? Precisely because Lizinova doesn't moralize, unlike the way that like internal performers of blot um, sociality always have to engage in this kind of like. Um, game of misrecognition they always have to talk about oh blot is very bad but this thing that i did here i'm just helping my friends you know it's not for me like it's i, I did it for someone else right um so i think that 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 i think that that's why like that framework is maybe more helpful for thinking about this negotiation um and and it's true that like that from the standpoint of of um of like Evans and also of, of Kukulian and, and my office, I think that there is this kind of really, it's, it's really weighed by this, by, this, by this original sort of impetus, right? When did it go wrong, right? Like who are, were the ones who were responsible for, for screwing it all up? Um, and, and I think that like, and I do think that I'm, I'm being pulled towards trying to reframe that in terms of this, well, look, this is just like what, um how the collective understanding of 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 negotiating this concept of freedom looked like right and zgrad was no different than everybody else who was around because everybody was a part of this of the same of the same sociology and, and i'm even starting this is this is kind of like like i really i think i arrived at this thought today like really that well like if they were more rigorous, right? Like if there was like a more more of a rigorous like like splitting up of, of, of forces, I'm not so sure that the Gakachepe um, would have failed or should have failed because they weren't 100% wrong. Like, and there are many things, like if you go and you watch like Akhramiev or all these people when they go on Zgrad and they sort of talk about the problems with the country, uh, the problems with the military, the problems with the trade, trade union movement, they actually sound very cogent. Like I was actually scared by how much cogent they sounded, <laughs> how cogent they sounded in those moments. So, so I'm not like I'm not I'm not here to like to like to cheerlead for the Soviet like fascist junta, but I, but I am, but I am to but I am here to say that I think that like there was a certain kind of innocence to this like idea of like anti gukachepe solidarity um, that was only possible precisely because there wasn't a clearer kind of like 
like theorization and division and political sort of uh, fracturing. And I think that if, if there were, I'm not so like, it's not so clear to me that the Gacachipe didn't have supporters and couldn't actually reasonably argue for supporters, especially in the conditions of 91 in August. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I definitely think that that's um, something I've been thinking about. Um, but then at the same time, like it, it's, it's hard not to like fall into that like retrospective crap right of like looking for for the where did it go wrong kind of question yeah i'm still still trying to figure out how to like negotiate my my way out of that it's about the soviet context it's a tv studio that fell apart yes that happened. yeah a tv studio that fell apart and then, and then went back together right in, in in this kind of in this in this uh different sort of way um yeah that's right, but then, but then it does have this kind of it because because it's so bound up with these events of of specifically these like August Putsch days, right? Um, it it takes on this kind of like a larger kind of story, right? And without the Soviet context, are they really the Beatles of Perestroika? You know, like it's kind of a yeah. I think there's all sorts of like symbolic negotiation of like how important this show is. It's happening here. Hi, yeah. hi. Uh, I th thanks, oh. Huggle, for giving us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks for giving us a peek into some of your fun stuff you're working on. Um, I was interested, it's curious that you thought Ledinova wasn't moralizing because I she's such like, she calls Blot misrecognition trick, which is I think very moralizing and negative. Um, I think that instead, I think it's, I think you were, you know, it's great that you found this kind of like interesting sociality that is modeled on these shows. And I think, um, maybe Ledinova is not necessarily the best, but maybe using something like Mos and the gift. Uh -huh. uh, and he, it's really about this other kind of really like social relationship that happens through exchanges of gifts. Mm -hmm. um, and even money, right? Doesn't have to be part of exchanges that are marketized. It seems like what you're saying is at this moment, this, you know, wads of $100 bills were really exchanged as these sort of miraculous gifts that then demand reciprocity, which is why it's seemingly the viewers, right, have to repay these gifts. So I, you know, highly recommend The Gift. It's a fun little book, but also Ksenia Cherkayev, right, sort of her, her work sort of takes a counter legend of a kind of analysis of this late Soviet uh, ethics of mutual aid as a kind of a an ambigu unambiguously positive, like emo uh -huh. something that's tangled up with only with positive emotions and not these kind of what Legend of a Calls, right, kind of negative emotions of misrecognition. So, um, which I think it's true that, you know, Perestroika was all about kind of this sort of making these informal networks suddenly meaningful. Um, and then, right, and that stuff was foreclosed once the economy swung full, like, trying to be you know structured with all these other kinds of forces so but uh -huh. yeah it seems like a fun time and i'm glad you're you're writing about it and making sense of it so thanks i really appreciate the 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 the, the um bringing myself up to speed on on the on the kind of the later um anthropological studies of this yeah for sure um i i i have heard of xenia's work um, I am definitely gonna gonna go into that. I, you know, with with it's true that Lizinova does have that kind of a negative association. I think she's she's following kind of like the the emotive lines of force relative to like her informants, right? Who are all kind of like very standoffish about barter. I'm sorry about about blood. Um, and uh, but I'm also just I'm one thing that I was really surprised by in her in her book is how. It is always only um, a story being told in the context of the um, of this kind of um, um, of of this dealing dealing in the con basically dealing in the context of this economies of shortage and just 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 kind of negotiating your sociality to others in order to get stuff to stabilize uh, and to kind of like continue the stable network of social change. I'm struck the extent to which. There is no, uh, she really never thinks about how Blatt or any of that kind of sociology moves into the political field, right? Um, it really is not mentioned at all. Um, and I do think that like in these moments like Gekachepe, 
um, and in that coalition, you really get, because there's always something so slippery, right? Like using, uh, using this like, um, let me tell the pro-democracy movement. Well, like it's too, like, like, it's it's too slippery, right? That 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 term, like it doesn't seem quite right to say that that's what's happening in the in the anti dictatorship and it's all the more slippery to say that because right, like two years later, it's going to be because Bulatov and Yeltsin fighting it fighting it out, right? So so what, what happens then? Like, do we does this term make sense? So like I think like what always happens um, is that once you start thinking about this kind of given term for more than five minutes, then you're like, well, I don't know what to do with it anymore. Like, I don't know what to do with pro-democracy anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and which is why I was sort of trying to reach for it for something else. But I will for sure look at Ksenia's work and, and uh, did you know it references Mouse for sure, M Moss for sure in her, in her reading too. Although she says that Blot is a little bit different than, than, than gift giving. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pasha, for a wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about uh, something you mentioned about the uh, Gardat in this connection. And, that, and I also know that you have this very interesting article about Stubbe Gardat, what, where, when, that show, and the context, context of the 60s. And I think there are so many parallels uh, initially uh -huh. with Polish and Stubbe Gardat, for instance. Uh, this whole reliance on the roulette mechanism mm -hmm. for the table mm -hmm. and this whole idea of chance yeah. um, is kind of a descent in both shows. Uh -huh. uh, the whole idea of Paul Chudias, the game of one, one does anything could happen, especially in the beginning. Uh, what is interesting, I think, is that the way they're treating their audience is um, very opposite in a way, mm -hmm. um, because it seems like uh, there is absolutely no uh, boundary in um, Portage Yes, yeah. between uh, the audience and the program. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Stub de Canta, they're relying so strictly on keeping uh, the audience separated mm -hmm. while still very much present because they're relying on the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about what you make of the way the, sh the shows engage with um, their audiences in those two. Mm -hmm different cases and whether yeah we can you know, yeah you know the about this uh exchange uh-huh um and potentially even how blood happens in one case and how uh -huh. it doesn't happen in another case ah yeah that's interesting um about blood and story in story like yeah you know um where it doesn't happen presumably you know um i i it's 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 funny though, but but doesn't it really though? Because there's all these moments in Chig in in Chigaka where, like, uh, Varashilov goes on and says, "The rule of this season is that you're out. You will never be seen again. You will be shown the door. You are banned forever, right?" And then by like episode five, he's like, "Here's a special red jacket for my favorite players. You will be back next season." And then like you know, or, or, or right? So there's all sorts of ways in which. He's constantly, on the one hand, trying to like announce in this kind of disembodied dictatorial way what the rules are, and it's like the rules are the rules and the rules, but right, and then he and he sort of fixes them. Um, so there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Yeah. You can very easily become an actual protagonist of the show. Yeah. Coming from the audience. Yes. Whereas. In the like that. Like that is really, um, really takes very seriously this idea of like of of uh, of a meritocracy and of a uh, of an idea of like um, of an empowered elite, an elite that deserves its status. Like it's a very like it, it enamored with this kind of basic sort of aristocratic ethos, um, and pitches it very hard to an audience that it interpolates as, as a kind of a Soviet greater elite, which is this technical intelligentsia. These people who um, on the one hand are the masses, but they don't like to think of themselves as the masses. They like to think of themselves as like a of a junior. Um, and so, um, so like Shtoji Gagdai is really premised on that mode of sociality and, and, and Varashilov is, is, is very much invested in it and Varashilov, you know, is the one who is able, because of that structuring of his show, is able to keep things very clear for himself in 91, 1990, 91. There's none of this like, like free flow of money this way and the other, right? None of this kind of like informal exchange. But as Shilov goes on, this is an intellectual casino, the only place in Russia where you can earn money with the power of your mind, 
right? This is his like moniker in 91. Um, and he's very like much more clearly enunciating this, um, this very clear version of this like pro-democracy liberal capitalist discourse. He's much more, um, much, much, much more clarified about it for sure. And I think that what, what happens with, with Zgliad is that like they are, or not with Zgliad, but with, um, with, uh, with Polish yes, is I think they, on the one hand, like somebody like Listiv seems to have that same sensibility personally like as this like empowered elite, like, right. And all these people who are like, well, we're in charge because like we know languages, like and we were, you know, stationed abroad and we like read books and, and et cetera, right. All of this kind of like, like story of why Zgliad deserves to be um, empowered, right. Um, and like, and then Lisev goes and puts on a tuxedo, right. With that, with those like Dobermans, right. And he does that, no, sorry, those not Dobermans, they were Great Danes. Um, and, uh, and uh, and he actually those commercials air on Stokes Hagda actually, um, and uh, but then but then like something totally different happens when he's in this other space when he ends up being in the space of Polish yes, and I do think that something is happening there, where um, where maybe like he wanted to have this kind of he wanted to have much more of just a show about purely about the flow of money, so so I so now that I'm sort of answering this question I'm like sort of realizing that well. They're actually similar in this one way, which is that neither of them really wanted to be about the flow of money. Both of them, um, kind of, e even some something like 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 Polish yes, that starts out like that, then becomes about something else. And Stokes and Kagda is always very worried that whatever it is that's happening with money, we don't want this to be just like, you know, filthy lucre. You know, we want this to be like a place where where like aristocrats gamble, right? It's like it's like when German, you know, in, in, in the Queen of Spades watches his friends gamble. It's not about the money, right? It's about showing that you're able to just wager, you know, with abandon, you know, because that you don't care for your financial well-being, you don't care for your material status, you just throw it all on the table and just just wage your right. And that's what makes you a real aristocrat, unlike German, who's always calculating, right? And so he can't do it. Um, so I definitely think that both of these shows then are confronting this problem of, well, they can't actually go and take on this pure money ethos, um, even when they want to. And, and uh, Chikaka definitely doesn't even want that, right? I think that, uh, but they, they definitely want to make it legit. They want to make money legit. Um, and so they do it by, by putting it inside of this like aristocratic um, kind of a milieu, yeah. And then I guess what happens is that, or with Polish yes, is they instead put it inside of this more folksy, like gift exchange kind of milieu. And it happens accidentally on Zgad and intentionally on Stoichek like that. And that's, I'm sorry, on Polish yes, accidentally. So that's something to think about, yeah, for sure. Um, so I have a couple of comments here that are related that I want to read out loud. Um, and then uh, I know Bradley has a question in the virtual audience. Um, so, okay, comments as follows. Um, Don writes, if memory serves, the Zbidad guys came out of the Kumsamal of her apparatus. So of course, so of course did a lot of other early entrepreneurs and that's what these guys were. Might that help to explain their role in the USSR, uh, the Russian Federation began to split and how they got caught. In. And then also he says, the the guys weren't fascists. They were authoritarians who understood the logic of the Soviet system much better than war beef. That runs crosswise with the intent attempt to revive his career by speaking for a Russia, which had never been both dominant and subordinate, never had its own organizations under the USSR. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Masha has uh, says. Uh, on Ksenia Chirkaev, uh, self-made boats and social self-management, but also key is just Marcel Mautz and other theories on non-capital gift exchange. She also says, it is very good people thinking about democracy as energizing people, already doing things through mutual aid slash social networks uh, with the state uh, withering away. It makes sense. And Gorbacho withered the state away in a very determined fashion. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, sorry, I know that was like a, like a close three um, two comments. I don't know if you want to respond to any of that or maybe, Bradley should ask the question in the meantime. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna write down this question. It comes. I'm just gonna write that down, and maybe, maybe something will come up. Okay, but let's, let's hear, let's hear Brad's question. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Unmute. All right. Hi, Pablo. Hey, thanks what's up, this, man? Thanks for this talk. This is great. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, because uh, for a couple of reasons, because you made a couple of connections to, to sort of thought era legacies here, um, and also because of the sort of emphasis on the, the, the style and the clothing, um, it, you know, this, this uh, uh, especially the Zgliad uh, um, stuff that you showed earlier made me think of the, um, the way that uh, Lipovetsky and, and his, his dad, uh, Naum Leiderman, uh, framed, uh, especially Aksionov in, in the Tha as Bunt Stilium. Um, and, uh, you know, which, which connects, I think, really well to a lot of the Birmingham school stuff on, on subcultures. Um, uh, and, you know, what happens in, in the thaw is this Bundstilium is then uh, immediately sort of recoded as political by the state, right? So it's, it's inescapable uh, in the state uh, in, in, in those contexts. And then I, I'm wondering sort of is, is the sort of death of Zgliad um, sort of what happens to a Bundstilium when there is no moral panic, right? This, this idea of subcultures, the subculture sort of def depends for its vitality on the moral panic of, the, uh, of the, the dominant culture, right? And if there is no moral panic or if the moral panic is Gika Chipe, if it is overcome, right? What, what happens uh, to, to that Bundstilium? Does it sort of dissolve or does it coalesce into something that has any sort of po political articulation um, in any way? Um, and I just wonder if, if you kind of see that connection um, there with the, with the Tha era legacies and if that's, um, if that's a, a way that might be, I, I don't know how that would apply to, to Poli Chudies, but uh, as far as what happens to Zgliad, uh, that seems to be maybe, maybe relevant uh, mm. way of thinking. I really like to put just this term moral panic on the table. It's an interesting way to like really, I wonder, I mean, to think of to think of as a kind of as a kind of moral panic. I mean, in one sense, it's a, it seems like incredibly sacrilegious, right? That my my the heart of the heart of my of my of my you know deeply internalized Russian liberalism really it really hurts when I when I think of when I think of anti as a, a um, disposition as a moral panic. Um, but I definitely want to think through that for sure. Um, yeah, I think that this kind of bunt stilium with Zgliad, um, why does Zgliad fall apart? Like, like I mean, uh, the question to me is even like less, less that Zgliad falls apart, right? It's that, um, it's that um, the way that it then gets reconstituted through all of these like independent shows that then follow up after Zgliad, right? On the one hand, they, those shows like are all basically just spin-offs of all of Zgliad formats, right? And everybody's like in charge of their own thing and everybody's happy, right? Like the, the post Zgliad crowd is very happy to have what they have, right? So it's all, almost not even right to say that it falls apart. It's more like the question that they couldn't see that it was about to transform that's puzzling. That they couldn't see in that moment of 91 that that the line of force in 91 actually opened up for them was to just just play out the full the, was to play out this kind of the their their commitment to pluralism to the hilt where everybody gets its own gets his own show where they can invite anybody they want right um and in a way that's that's very much a success right of this uh, of the the success of the rebellion is that everybody can then be their own rebel Right and be in charge of their own of their own like little project, um, so. But I I am, I am I am curious about this idea of like only identifying, an authoritarianism through um, through the sensibility of moral panic, right, and not through the sensibility of like, well, what is this thing institutionally, right? Like, how does it how is it supposed to work, right? Like, what. Um, what, what, how does it, how does it connect to like how the institutional players are, are, are working right now, right? Like all of the kind of like more sophisticated questions about, about like, about like what is authoritarianism, what is democracy, what is like, you know, the, the collective power and et cetera, right? Like that stuff is all bracketed out. So I definitely think that maybe there's something to this, like thinking of that, of that, of, of only being concerned about like the, the threat in the context of a moral panic and not in the context of like a more, um, a different kind of mode of thinking about it. Well, for sure, think about that, yeah. Um, 
I don't I don't see any questions in the virtual setting uh, or necessarily in the audience. So then uh, maybe I can ask a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, so I feel like the this like freestyle that you're talking about mm -hmm. that was so fresh and new in the 90s, uh, it sort of like set a tone mm -hmm. for me. You know, like that that like um uh, attempted authenticity or like canned spontaneity is still something that is like prized on television. Um, mm -hmm. like, in, like somehow like the you know to the extent that there's choreographing, it's often like in the direction of creating the illusion of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if I don't know. I'm wondering if how you see that in terms of um, what your know, Jack calls the performative shift, like in the late Soviet period. Like, is there another? Mm -hmm. Is there a different performative shift that happens over the course of the '90s? And like also. Um, now that like actual spontaneity has been all but like evacuated for Russian television, mm -hmm. um, then like how do you you know how do you compare the like nineties scene in that sense to what's happening now or closer to the present day? Um, I mean, isn't isn't the kind of the question of there, there's quite the, 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 I think the kind of the the galling irony right of like Russian television today is that there's actually quite a lot of this I think spontaneity within very much just kind of like set limits of like everybody knows that your fancy semi-legal apartment is probably going to be taken away if you touch certain themes and if you don't touch them then you can make your stupid jokes right so Jerry Springer style yes so you can do that well that actually was apparently staged allegedly that's actually oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so it is definitely the case that that, that uh, this all of and this is what Evans is very clear on. And then if you um, read Vladimir Sapak, it's very clear uh, he's very clear on this as well, right? This early theorist of television that I'm fascinated by. Um, uh, he, I mean, they're all certain that television is a spontaneous medium, but nothing else works on TV. And the reason that they say is because, well, well, for Sapak, he thinks it's because the camera is too close to the face. Um, so in the '60s cameras are not sophisticated enough to shoot from far away. Um, and so because the camera is too close to the face, like if you're not spontaneous and sincere, it's gonna see that. And so it's not gonna work. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then uh, but then that's all in, always like only like half an explanation. It always seems like something, there's like a bigger investment in Sapak and the idea that well, only sincerity works in TV because it's always associated with like, well, it's also the intelligentsia medium and only the intelligentsia can be sincere. Therefore, they're the only ones who are good on television. Um, so there's this heavy investment of like of sincerity and spontaneity in theorizing television. And um, the other reason is because you can always turn the TV off. Like no one's making you keep it on. Right. And so you don't have the same effect of like the captive audience, like in a theater um, where like they're really not going to leave. Right. With a TV, you can always switch the channel. Um, so so this is I'm just thinking about that, all of that early, uh, early theorizing. Um, and I think that that's maybe why um, an appearance of spontaneity is like continues to be so prized. Right. There's always this. So you think it's like it's yeah. sort of the media, basically, and it has not like it has not so much to do with like the you know the the shifts in just like the media narrative from the you know it started to the 90s and then to the 2000s i think that anybody who was coming from say maladyoshka um was absolutely certain you can only be spontaneous to make good tv i think going back to the 1960s they would have all said that i think that it's really telling that like the preface to Sapak's book that was republished in the late 1980s was written by Kravchenko, which is who was the head of Gostida Radio. Right? And he basically says, I envy anybody who's reading this book for the first time because this is like the TV Bible. You know, so Kravchenko, somebody who's also overseeing the like the very stodgy stuff of like you know, Vremia and all of this kind of like stuff that you're used to. Like even Kravchenko knows that he'd rather be like doing Stogie Kagda. You know, so 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 I definitely think that there is just a, a fundamental, like professional um, investment in the idea that this medium has to be oriented towards spontaneity for it to work, um, at least in the Russian context. I also think, though, that that like everything in the Russian context, it always gets them enmeshed into all of this kind of like proto-political discourse, right? Um, and it's. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 
you know, when the real world debuts in the United States, like it's like a cool new event, but I don't, and I guess it could be read as somewhat political, but it's not political in the same way. Yeah, like it's just not the same. Yeah, because, because, because you have other institutions that mediate people's access to politics, yeah. right? But Zgrad is the direct mediator, right? Zgrad, or, or even really, Others, even even something that's apolitical, like like becomes a mediator, right? Even in, in a way that like a game show in the U.S. can never be. There's no constituency yeah. of like Jeopardy goers that like that like you know Biden is gonna go canvas with, you know? Like it's just it's unimaginable, um, almost unimaginable. He might go on Jeopardy to like promote like I don't know the vaccine, but he's not gonna go on Jeopardy to like convince the viewers of Jeopardy to vote for him. But that literally what is what happened with. With Shtogzi Kagda, like like Chubais was on the set of Shtogzi Kagda, promoting his political party in '93. Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, there's I think it's there's there's all these ways in which like these become venues for some sort of like you know feedback loops or some sort of like uh, some sort of um, political action, right? Collective action, right? And um, in in a way that. That is maybe not necessary in a place where you have other venues where you can do that. Um, and uh, and in a, in a way, like I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm sort of not prepared to make any arguments on contemporary Russian television. I don't think I don't feel that I really understand it uh, very well. So I haven't really like really thought about it. Um, but this early '90s moment, I definitely think that 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 heritage of spontaneity of the late Soviet period and the, all the kind of the political imaginary that that informs is, I think, sort of named as the political body of the 90s, the body that wants to be like left alone with these like imaginary of these spontaneous exchanges and like, you know, um, like the worst thing that can possibly happen is some like politruk or commissar saying, ah, oh, you're not doing this right, you need to organize, right? So, um, so yeah, I think I think that that's kind of where where I'm seeing that, that connection. Um, uh, okay, um, so uh, if people do not, do, does anyone else have questions from the from the audience? I don't see any hands or anything in the Zoom, so maybe it makes sense to conclude here. Um, Paolo, thank you so, so much. This was very rad. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's, it's a pleasure to see people in, in real life and also not in real life. <laughs>